postprandial excitement. That's what we're talking about right now. We're going to go through some really exciting things right now. So keep your pants on and your powder tight. We're going to talk about history and physical examination and differential diagnosis. So this is probably the most important part other than the physical exam video. How do you glean the information from a patient to figure out what's wrong? You now know what can go wrong in the spine. The question is, how do you get that information out from the patient? Well, we know pain is generated by damaged structures unless there's a chronic radiculopathy. That really still is a damaged structure, though. Inflammation is required to sensitize the pain nerves. We know that. We know that each structure has a quality and referral of pain that is related and has a characteristic pain signature. And your job is to decipher this code. Not that hard, but it does get a little complex. So, six factors to ask questions for what you're looking for. Where is the pain? Sounds simple, but many patients won't tell you the right answer. Where's the pain? Oh, it's in my hip. Where's your hip? They point right here into their SI joint and buttocks. So you can't expect a description. You have to be demonstrative. What is the pain intensity at each location? Everybody should know the VAS or visual analog score, zero to 10. What activities increase or decrease the pain? We already know flexion loads certain structures, unloads others. Extension does the same thing. So you can use those tools. What is the history of the onset? Is it a slow, gradual onset, or do they bend down and feel a pop and two days later have leg pain? Ding, ding, ding. So you can use the history to understand that. And what is the impairment to the patient? I've got terrible, miserable leg pain. Well, what's the visual analog scale, zero to 10? It's a two to a four. Well, wait a second, you gotta ask yourself what's going on because a four pain doesn't even take your mind off of anything. So you've got to ask what the impairment is. Well, what can't they do? This is hugely important because you have to find out how the disorder is affecting their life. So I like to use forms to organize patient information. You're welcome to go to neckandback.com, look on the headers for patient forms, and download this and put your own name on it. I don't care about plagiarization, doesn't matter. This form gives you an idea of categorization so you can understand, well, who's their primary care doc? Get an idea from that. What doctors have they seen before for this? How many problems have they had? And who's taking care of them? And what are their current symptoms? It's, it's a nice way to organize your thoughts. And if you do it the same way, every time it fits a pattern that your own brain can follow nicely. Next page. Past medical history, well, some people will say, who cares? But honestly, psoriasis, could they have psoriatic arthritis, right? Herpes simplex, could they have some kind of problem with a shingles problem? Gastritis, could they have an ulcerative colitis or Crohn's? I mean, even though we want to pass on medical history, you can glean a lot of information from this. All spine surgeries in the past, unfortunately, in my clinic, these lines are all filled in. Well, a lot of, half of what we do is patients who failed other spine surgeries. But, I mean, it's important for anybody taking care of a patient to find out what's happened. Medications, allergies, pretty obvious. Family social work history. Again, social history, why is that important? Well, who cares if they're married or living with another or divorced? Well, if they have problems, if they can't lift and bend, and they don't have secondary help, their house isn't clean. How are they functioning? What, what's going on? You can learn a lot from these forms. Their work history. Is this a work comp injury? And you can get a history of the work comp injury from this. So I find these forms to be hugely valuable. Of course, review of systems can be a pain, but who cares about vision change unless you have MS, right? So again, you have to start to look at these things. Skin, rash, could you have secondary or tertiary syphilis? It's, it sounds bizarre, but all these things can mean something. So pain diagrams, the single most valuable tool for patient history evaluation, period. This tells you more than you want to know. 
They may draw old pain patterns from the initial symptoms. For example, three months ago, they had pain that radiated all the way down to their left foot, but now it sits in the buttocks, but they draw the left foot in. So this is not perfect. You have to make sure and understand temporally how they're doing. There's no pain percentages on here, and there's no mechanical provocations. So it doesn't tell you how the pain is aggravated, but this, if you look at this and you listen to their history, 95% of the time you'll get the right diagnosis without doing an exam. I didn't say that, don't record that, okay? So how do you split the pain up into sections? Because this is hugely important also. Well, pain can radiate from the lumbar spine into the thoracic spine. You can have central, axial, upper low back pain. You can have paraspinal, lower back pain or unilateral pain. This all means something. SI pain, single or bilateral. Buttocks pain. You can have anterior thigh pain, posterior thigh pain, lateral thigh and hip pain. And again, what you're trying to do is discern a pattern. And now you guys know, well, the hip, God, that can cause lateral hip pain, but it can go into the groin. But so can an L1 or an L2 radiculopathy. So you start to understand these things. They have pain right there. That could be an L5-S1 root with mild irritation. Could be a hamstring tendinosis. Start to use your differential skills. Uh, as I like to say, patients confuse things with verbal skills. Ask them to point out where their pain is. Because so many times they won't know. It's in the anterior thigh, Doc. It's right here. You know, pointing to the lateral lower knee. So ask them the questions, and they'll confuse unilateral buttocks pain with unilateral low back pain. So you have to maybe palpate their spine. during. It's still history, but it's part of the physical exam. They're going to point to you where their pain is. This is really important. So deficiencies. Oh, well, let's go back. These say nothing of weakness, loss of function, or activities that trigger or relieve pain. You must understand how different disorders present with activities, right? So somebody's got pain right there. When does it occur? Well, it only occurs at night when I go to bed. When I stand and walk and dig shovel, shovel drywall, it doesn't hurt at all. Well, that's a big difference. Then that hurts all the time when I bend and lift and goes away when I lie down. So you need to know pain location, pain intensity, position of most intense pain, and relief of pain. So you're going to get percentages of back versus leg, and you're going to fit it all into 100%. We'll talk about that. Yes? Do you have tips or tricks to how to mobilize that to percentages? That's the next slide, I think. Nope, it's, I lied, but I do that a lot lately. <laughs> so <laughs> visual analog scale. So you're trying to first get the intensity of the pain. Everybody should have this. It's on my chart. And you try and break it down, mid-back pain, low-back pain, SI, buttocks, groin, and leg. And you split it up so you make people start to think. A lot of people don't know the difference between SI and buttocks pain. Nonetheless, some people might, and you get them to understand what's going on. Groin pain is pretty easy. Leg pain, that doesn't tell you anterior, posterior, lateral to the foot, but it tells you the intensity of the pain. So percentages to differentiate pain regions. There it is. So this patient came in. Look at the pain diagram. Do you see all this? There's pain up in the shoulders, pain in the mid-thoracic, pain in the lower back, a little darker down here, pain that radiates down into the right thigh, but not below the knee, but maybe something a little bit in the foot. But here, the, the examiner looks at this and says, 95% of the pain is right there. So you look at it, and it makes a big difference between the initial pain diary and pain pattern. That almost looks fibromyalgia or, God, multi-level lumbar degenerative changes. But now the pain is right above the SI and lower lumbar spine, 95% there, 5% there. That is a big difference. So what you want to do is break all the pain up, find out where the most intense pain is, and then percentages, percentage it so that it adds up to 100%. So what activities induce pain? 
structures are aggravated by flexion versus extension loading maneuvers. This is important. You differentiate disorders based upon the exam. So what does impact do? What patients are going to have impact pain? There's basically two sets of patients. What? IDR. So severe degenerative disc disease, bad impact pain. Also, instability. So you can start to think in your head, what could do what? Flexion. When they have increased pain with flexion, what are you doing? You're loading the disc, right? And unloading the facets. So you could be instability. That's how you start to think. Extension is going to aggravate spondylolisthesis, central stenosis. What's the pain with extension? Is it central low back pain? Is it buttocks leg pain? So now you're starting to, ah, that could be foraminal stenosis or lateral recess stenosis. But it came on immediately three weeks ago. What does that tell you? Probably, not always, but probably a disc herniation. Could be that they had foraminal stenosis and the nerve is now swollen. But I mean, this is how you start to think. Transitional instability, sit to stand, ballistic motions, sneezing, coughing, jumping, sleeping, waking at night. Waking at night, is that a red flag? It is. Is that bad, generally? 98% of the time, no. Patients with what I call CBS, or crappy back syndrome, will wake at night because it inflames. The PLI, P, pay for it later pain, remember the inflammatory cascade? So waking at night is commonly not a bad thing, but you have to push the red flag up to make sure you don't miss anything. Again, flexion sports, extension sports, and loading sports. So if you start, I'm not going to go over the whole list. This is in the book. But extension activities, anything that triggers it like this, will, that, those are questions you can ask. Well, I'm a big pitcher. Well, you know, whoa, wait a second. That's an extension activity. So it aggravates on the windup? Yeah, it really does. Or surfing. Surfing is a flexion activity until you're paddling out, right? When you're paddling out, you're extending. Think about the biomechanics of the action of the, of the uh, participation. Flexion activities, I don't have to go through all these, but these are things you have to start to think about. And then impact activities. Somebody's got isolated disc resorption will not like to run, but anything that is associated with running like soccer, snowmobiling, alpine skiing, all these things will aggravate that. So. What is important with quality and temporal nature of pain? Time of day. Patients with IDR will have night pain that will wake them up at night. They'll also have delayed onset pain. So ask me these questions. If, yeah, I'm okay during the day, but if I've had a big day, that night I'm miserable. That tends to fit with isolated disc resorption. Pain in the morning prior to getting out of bed when versus, versus pain arising to stand. The spine at night, okay, here's another question. What is the lowest point of your body when you go to bed? What? Your butt or your lumbar spine, unless you sleep on your side or back. So you have a sump. During the day, do you think your ankles swell a little bit? Gravity pulls fluid down to your ankles. At night, where does the fluid settle? In your back. If you've got stenosis and it swells, you're going to have some problems at night. When you get up in the morning, it's going to take you 15, 20 minutes to straighten up before you can finally push that fluid out. So these are kinds of things you look for. Impact activities, vibration, delayed onset pain, weakness over time, and you have to differentiate pain inhibition versus neuron loss, activity relationships, and activity restrictions. So if you start to suspect a disorder, you start to hone in on the associated symptoms. Somebody says, you know, I have pain standing and walking. Well, ask them about that. Tell, ask them about bending forward, using a shopping cart. When is it worse? When is it better? If their spouse is in the room, ask their spouse, are they bending forward? Oh, yeah. You know, I walk with him, and the more he walks, the more he's bent forward like this until he's finally looking for a chair to sit down. What does that fit with? neurogenic claudication, unless it's bilateral, I'm sorry, unilateral leg pain, then it's going to be, well, what's stenosis? 
lateral recess or foraminal stenosis. So you can start to hone down and come up with a diagnosis simply by listening to the patient. Ask if they flex at the waist, they have an, ask the SO. This is important because patients themselves won't have an image that they're bent forward or slumped or tilted to the side. Ask their significant other, you'll get a lot of answers. So my favorite quote from Voltaire, the lower back is at the crossroads where the psyche meets the soma, where the brain meets the body. And it's true, you can have a crappy elbow, a lousy knee, a miserable foot, or a crappy shoulder, and you won't be depressed. If you have a crappy back, you will get depressed because you can't do the activities you'd like to do. So commonly, patients will get reactive depression. So ask them the four depression questions. Anhedonia, insomnia, lethargy, and irritability. So lack of fun, they're sort of walking through mud, they have a black cloud over their head, they're not really enjoying their life. Insomnia, do they get to sleep, do they stay asleep? Lethargy, are they always tired, irritable? Ask your significant other if they sort of flash out at them. And many of the patients will have this, not necessarily because they have a predisposed depression, but because chronic back pain will create this kind of problem. So, leg pain characteristics. Leg pain can be generated by radiculopathy, obviously, probably the most common cause, but hip disorders cause upper leg pain, tendon disorders cause buttocks and leg pain with stretch or night pain, sacroiliac disorders can cause SI pain, peripheral neuropathy causes foot pain, typically symmetrical, nerve entrapment disorders cause leg pain, Neuralgia parasthetica, you guys know that? Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve gets caught in the belly. Perineal neuropathy, the common perineal nerve gets caught right around the knee. Tarsal tunnel syndrome. And we talked about sclerotomal pain. Can refer pain, but what's the difference between this and other pains? It only occurs when the initial pain becomes severe then it radiates, so it's not real referral pain, it's sclerotomal pain. So weakness questions. Weakness can originate from alert neurologic motor strength deficit, so an L5-S1 root compression with gastroxoleus weakness, or from pain inhibition. If they've strained their calf, you ask them to do a toe walk, and they can't stay up there, is it pain or is it weakness? You have to ask these questions. If the leg gives way due to pain when loaded, this may be from pain inhibition or both pain inhibition and weakness. Degenerative joints can also cause give way. So if somebody has an arthritic knee and they load it incorrectly, it's going to give out on them. That doesn't necessarily mean it's weak neurologically. It could be weak from pain inhibition. So walking aids are important to note. Usually, use of a cane is associated with degenerative joint disorders and not the spine. Unless you have something like a Trendelenburg gait, which we'll talk about. If you use a crutch or something like that, most of the time, it's gonna be a hip or a knee problem as a general rule. Bowel and bladder function. So you have to question them on it. Patients commonly have malfunction not related to a neurogenic bowel and bladder. So we're gonna to start to go back. How do you do an exam for a neurogenic bowel and bladder? Use a glove. Three things you're looking for, and if somebody says taste, you're out. <laughs> okay, so you're going to insert your finger into their rectum, and you're looking for first tone. Is it difficult or is it pallious? Because if you have a true bowel and bladder problem, you may not be able to have a toned sphincter. Can they contract against your finger? Important. They have to have a voluntary contraction. And number three, can they feel your finger? Is it numb? They say, I'm not sure it's there or not. I mean, these are important tests that you have to do if you think there's a cauda equina syndrome. Typically, you don't see chronic cauda equina syndromes. So remember, males can have, oh, sorry, have prostatic hypertrophy that causes obstruction and frequency. Females who've delivered especially will stretch your pelvic diagram, diaphragm and develop incontinence noted with coughing and sneezing. So you have to ask these questions. If somebody has perianal or perineal numbness 
and they have bowel problems and their sphincter is not working well, you've got to stop, drop, and figure out what's going on. So, as we talked about earlier, night pain is a, night pain is a red flag, but it is unlikely that night pain is a sign of an ominous condition. Again, if they have radiculopathy, isolated disc resorption, degenerative joint or central stenosis, they'll be awoken, but nine, I say 98% of the time. You'll find a neurologic or musculoskeletal reason for night pain. So even though you treat it like a red flag, most of the time you won't find anything. There are people who are unreliable historians. You ask them questions, you get five different answers. And then they change their answer again, and then they can't remember anything about an accurate history of pain. I don't remember when it started. There are some people who are becoming demented, not have a good grasp of symptoms. There are other patients that have a positive review of systems. So does your back hurt? Yeah. So it goes down to your leg? Yeah. Both legs? Oh, yeah. Does your hair hurt? Oh, terribly. Do your teeth ache? Oh, my God, yes. How'd you know? So there are difficult patients sometimes that are hard to get a history from. So you have to start to hone your diagnostic skills. A great way to do it is to look at a set of MRIs and x-rays and predict what symptoms could be generated. I call that looking backwards. So get an MRI, see a big herniation at four or five and say, this is what I'm gonna find on physical exam. This is what the patient's gonna tell me. And this is how you hone your information. A reciprocal exercise, take symptoms and predict what disorders can cause these symptoms, okay? The symptoms, image findings are not necessarily predictive of symptoms, but you want to get a good idea of what's going on by knowing, walking down a path and figuring out that path. That's how you diagnose people. So, instability. It's a feeling of gidway or shifting of the spine with standing and loading. Typically occurs at the first 20 degrees of spine flexion due to the transition of the lower two vertebra. The patient will feel the spine is unreliable and some will lock the back into extension while going through the flexion maneuver or the reversal of the normal lumbopelvic rhythm. And use a Gower's maneuver in flexion. So patients trying to get up will do that, but this disease process by our good friend Dr. Netter is what? Yeah, muscular dystrophy. Dr. Gower was the first one to pick up this sign, but patients with bad backs use it all the time. So quality of pain is important too. Burning, sharp, electrical, numbing are very helpful to understand pain generators. The pain distribution needs to be associated with these descriptors for differential diagnosis. Again, the more information you get and the more you know how to interpret, the easy it is to diagnose them. And as I said before, 95% of patients will have a correct diagnosis if you do the correct physical exam and you do the right history. Numbing pain generally is a dull ache associated with dull sensation found in radiculopathy. On examination, there might be no sensory loss, but hyperalgesia or hyperesthesia. So you might be comparing the L5 dermatones on either side, and they say one side is less than the other. But the question is, is the other side hyperesthetic or your side you just tested dull? So what you do is on the same leg, test two separate dermatomes. And if you test the one that's hyperagetic and you go to the next one up on the same leg and it's the same hyperanesthetic, then you have an issue that it's dull on the other side. You just have to compare one side to the other. Burning pain. Again, burning pain is typical for a chronic nerve root injury. Patients with this pattern, oh, it's, oh I'm sorry, already says polyneuropathy, so I stole my thunder. But burning pain is commonly associated with a peripheral neuropathy. Electrical pain, generally a sharp instantaneous pain that radiates down the nerve to the uh, individual to immediately freeze. Associated with severe nerve compression, but what else causes electrical pain? You remember? They're myths. So it's any kind of cord or nerve impression. It can be, you have to be careful, because people will say a sharp electrical pain can occur if they have an arthritic hip and you roll their hip in and they catch a spur. 
it feels like a sharp electrical pain. Cramps, that's a bad cramp. It's a tonic muscle contraction, can be related to nerve root motor weakness. So if you demand a lot, if you really exercise the muscle, I'm sorry, and they have cramping, neurologic deficiency of that particular muscle can cause cramping, but nocturnal cramping is also quite common too, so it may not be a neurologic disorder. It's just another piece of the differential diagnosis. Fasciculations occur in the face of muscle denervation. So if you have a muscle that's injured, after three weeks and you have Wallerian degeneration, that muscle is going to fasciculate the nerve cells that are not, I'm sorry, the muscle cells that don't have nerve conduction are going to start to fibrillate. That's, you can see that on the EMG, but you can see that on exam. We'll see that in the video earlier. The muscles will spontaneously contract and relax in a worm-like fashion. It'll occur within three weeks of the denervation injury, and it's also associated with ALS, but it's also associated with benign fasciculation syndrome. So again, all you're doing is taking the data and saying, I've got fasciculation. Is it nerve injury? Is it benign fasciculation syndrome? Is it ALS? You have to start asking those questions. You find what you look for and you see what you know. Skip pain. Very un... Oh my goodness. I must be hitting something. So skip pain where you have a buttocks pain and a foot pain and no radiation of pain down into the foot that can be generated by disc or facet referral pain and a separate pain generator. So, for example, you have a slight chronic radic and you have a tarsal tunnel syndrome, but you can, 10% of the time, the radiculopathy will not be complete, so you can have an S1 nerve root that'll go into the buttocks and the bottom of the foot and skip the rest of the leg. So, everybody has probably heard of the centralization phenomenon. It's a very big deal with... Uh, not Maitland, uh, McKenzie. So what happens is somebody has a significant radiculopathy and as the nerve improves, the pain starts to recede. So this is a guy with an L5 radiculopathy and the same pain three months later with an epidural in physical therapy. It's receding up, that's a positive sign. Bone pain, we talked about this again, deep boring pain and intense dull ache Inflamed and injured bone will be very sensitive to loading impact and vibration. Pain intensity will increase between 8 to 14 hours later. That's the P for it later, pay for it later pain, right? So something like this. You need to memorize the dermatomes. You need to memorize the dermatomes. You need to memorize the dermatomes so that you know what you're doing. And how you test them is with a Wartenberg wheel. So it's a little pinwheel that of course you have to run through alcohol every time you use it, but you want to use it on the skin gently, just the weight of it, because pinpoint measurements are much better than using a paper clip or your fingers. It's a much more sensitive way to do this. So what do these things look like on a pain diary? So I have, oh my goodness. So an S1 radiculopathy, the pain starts in the buttocks, can start in the back, and radiates typically down to the foot. Does it have to radiate all the way down to the foot? No. It can radiate just to the thigh. But then you can't easily differentiate an S1 from an L4. But if it goes down to the foot, it's at least an L5 or an S1 radiculopathy. L5 radiculopathy. If you look at this one, it radiates down, but it doesn't go to the bottom of the foot. It goes to the top and medial side of the foot. That fits perfectly with an L5 radiculopathy. And again, we're not seeing back pain, but that could be there too. L4 radiculopathy. This pattern is classic, buttocks pain still, posterior thigh, but then lateral aspect of the foot and doesn't go down to the ankle. What if you see an L4 radiculopathy, what are the two mu oh my goodness gracious. If, what are the two muscles you're going to test if you think you have an L4 radiculopathy? Yes. No. You write, you write half of it. Oh, for L4? L4. T? 
tib anterior and quadricep femoris. So those are the two muscles you want to test. And that'll give you a lot of information. An L3 radic looks very similar to this, because this is an L3 radic. So the person has anterior thigh pain, can go to or below the knee. Notice the buttocks is still involved. L1 or L2 radiculopathy looks just, well, the buttocks is involved, so the hip typically, but can, but typically doesn't radiate to the buttocks, but L1 and L2 will. But this pattern overlaps with hips. Okay, so this patient comes in, and this is a pars fracture in a 12-year-old with somatization. We saw this earlier, didn't we? Most of the pain, if you look at it, it's all over the place. And 12-year-olds aren't as good as us at figuring out, unless somebody's 12 years old in here, maybe I miss it. So they're not as good as us as to identifying pain location. They don't have as developed a nervous system. So this gal had pain all over the place, but if you really focus and ask her, her pain is mainly on the right side here. She had a localized right L5 pars fracture aggravated by loading. So here's a pain pattern, pain in the anterior thighs on both sides. It sort of radiates down. It's involved with numbness of the foot, both in front and back, numbness of the hands, pain in the neck radiating down. Now, I could say this could be L5-S1 large central herniation causing bilateral pain and numbness and a separate neck problem with compression of the uh, uh, C6 roots, bilaterally equal. But you got to be careful because people like this can have peripheral neuropathy, polymyalgia rheumatica, or fibromyalgia. And so look for sources. But when I see this, I start to question, boy, it's all over the place. That's hard to develop. You have to question what's going on. So these are pictures of typical patients Oh my goodness, with neurogenic claudication. So you'll notice they have pain in the back and in the buttocks. Pain in the buttocks a little lower here. But it doesn't tell you anything until you ask them questions. Which are? Walking, standing. Interestingly enough, patients with neurogenic claudication, some patients will say, I can walk all day long, I just can't stand at a party. Why is that? Because when you walk, they get, I'm, I must be hitting my computer, I'm sorry. When they walk, they're walking forward, but they don't notice it, so their spine is open. But when they stand, they stop and extend. So there are some differentials here. So neurogenic claudication, again, can cause stenotic lower back pain. So patients who have pain not in their buttocks, not in their thighs, but localized in their lower back, that can be from stenotic lower back pain. The typical questions you ask, if it's going to be a disc, what's going to cause pain? Flexion. So flexion for a bad disc, but these patients have pain in extension, and you bend them forward and they feel better. So that is stenotic lower back pain typically. So this one... This is one I'd have to really start to question what's going on. Weak and wobbly, weak and wobbly, weak and wobbly, paresthesias, pain, numbness. I mean, this could be a myelopathy, but it could be a fibromyalgia. So sometimes you can't figure out what you're getting just by this, obviously. Foraminal collapse, pain in the back radiating down the leg. You ask them, when does it hurt? It hurts when I stand and walk. So feel better when you sit? I love to sit. How about at night when you go to bed? Most of the time I'm fine. Sometimes it wakes me up at night. That's foraminal collapse or foraminal stenosis. Lateral recess stenosis. Very similar presentation to foraminal stenosis, but the root involved is always traversing, not exiting, meaning that the root here would be involved in foraminal stenosis. Lateral recess stenosis, it's always this root. So you might look at your x-rays and get some information from that. So foraminal stenotic patients, look at the foramen here. See this big black chunk sitting right there? See the slip here? So it's a degenerative slip with severe foraminal stenosis. And I said foraminal stenosis normally is pain with standing and walking. Yes, 
But if you have it long enough and you crunch the nerve long enough, you end up having chronic pain all the time. And so you have to ask them in their history, oh, you know, my leg hurt for a long time when I would stand and walk, but now it hurts all the time. That helps a lot to tell you what's going on. Instability or transitional pain. Here we have a nice 13 millimeter slip from, is this a degenerative or an ismic? Ismic. See the break in the bone right there? That end belongs right there. So it's an ismic spondylolisthesis. This occurs when an unstable structure subluxates or retranslates back to a normal alignment. So if you see this and you bend them backward and they don't change in position, does that mean it's not unstable? I mean, it's stuck in that position? No, because if you get their MRI, remember the MRI is done with them lying on their back. Many times if you see this slip and then you look at the MRI and their vertebrae are almost perfectly lined up, you can know that they have a translational problem just by looking at the two images. But you have to use x-rays and an MRI. Symptoms occur with rising out of a chair, getting up out of bed, Gower's maneuver. They don't like the first 20 degrees of bending and will lock their back. Remember, when you bend normally, you bend your back first, and then you bend your hips, they'll reverse that. And a feeling of give way or the back will give out. They feel tenuous. We already talked about peripheral neuropathy. We talked about the ascension. We talked about fiber length dependency. Worse at night with bed sheet foot contact disagreeable. You hear bilateral symmetrical numbness. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah. Is it worse at night? Yeah. Do you like sheets or covers? No. Do you like bigger shoes? Yeah. You mean you ask the right questions, you're going to have a diagnosis. Myelopathy. This is a patient. You look at it and you go, boy, this person's really sort of out of it. But this is myelopathy. They have imbalance in coordination, loss of fine motor skills. This is an unusual picture of myelopathy. Most of the time you won't see something like that, but you can't rule these things out. So myelopathy, again, associated with spasticity, long track signs, can be painless. Very important. There are no pain receptors in the spinal cord. So pain that's generated typically comes from foraminal stenosis or degenerative disc disease, but myelopathy can be painless. So the famous paperclip test. We use this all the time. I tell my patients it's my most sophisticated test because you simply find out where their pain is, you put the little circle of the paperclip directly over it and get an x-ray. Because your palpation, I'm a chiropractor as well as a spine surgeon, I am inaccurate by a level or two. And so I think that I'm right on and I'll put the paper clip on it and I'm going, holy jeez. So you have to be careful when you palpate. This is an invaluable tool, believe it or not. We use it a lot. And you have to be able to look backwards. So you look at the images and you try and determine what pattern of pain you would expect to see. So we look over here, look at these discs. What do you see? Isolated disc resorption. This is really multi-level disc resorption. Do you see a flat back? So yeah. So could they have a flat back stance? Yeah. Do you see the conus compression here? Could they have bowel and bladder involvement? Yes. If we go to the side, you'll see they have foraminal stenosis at L2, 3, and 3, 4. Could they have pain dynamically radiating down their leg, standing and walking? This is how you start to use the tools to try and figure out what's going on. Okay. Questions? Yes? With the uh, SI joint thing being about 6% of 1 out of 20 patients, do you feel that there's a class of activity that aggravates that SI joint pain? SI joint patients are very similar to hip patients. They don't like getting in and out of a car, getting off a bicycle, transitions like skaters get it all the time because of their lateral hip bends and the pain's gonna be right over the SI joint. The problem is it doesn't give up its secrets easily and the only way to really diagnose it is to numb the joint and have relief of pain twice. Twice. Other questions? Okay, question. yes, go ahead. I was hoping you could put it back on the foraminal slide just to see 
because a lot of these presentations you're talking about are chronic, these are not acute presentations of pain, these are chronic, chronic presentations. If you have an acute presentation of pain, most of the time it'll probably be a herniated disc, but it could be that you've had foraminal stenosis for years and lived with it, and then you did one activity where you laterally bent and compressed the nerve, causing the nerve to swell, and now you have an acute foraminal narrowing because the root is swollen, and it looks like a herniated disc. But most, excuse me, most of the time, these are not acute. Annular tears are acute, herniated discs are acute, and fractures, of course. So when you're taking the history and you're saying, hey, are you okay walking? And they're saying yes. In your mind, you're saying, hey, flexion is okay. And then when you say, are you okay sitting after that, or do you not like sitting, is that your basic test for extension? Or, or what are you thinking when you're asking? So if they say, I like standing and walking, my leg feels, it's not, the complaint is buttocks and leg pain radiating to the foot, let's say. And they say, I like standing and walking, and I don't like sitting. Well, think about the mechanics. If it's a herniation at L4-5 or L5-S1, you're going to stretch the nerve root over that herniation when you bend forward and sitting simulates bending forward. So that is probably a herniation at 4.5 or 5.1. If you have better results sitting and worse results standing, it's probably going to be foraminal stenosis or lateral recess stenosis. Still could be caused by a herniation. You can have a foraminal herniation or a lateral recess herniation. But that's how you start to differentiate the two when you start to think about what's happening. It could be the opposite. Uh, Please so it's, it's not always specific. Now. Well, no, it's, it's not specific. That's the problem, is 95% of the time your diagnosis is correct, but not 100%. You need imaging, and imaging will tell you what's going on. There are guys I know who will do injections without imaging, but you sometimes have non-success because you're off. Remember, the far lateral herniation at L4-5 will do the same thing as the posterior lateral herniation at L3-4, affect the same route. So you don't know what you're injecting if you inject one versus the other. But if you're, you know, going through odds, the odds are 95%, you'll have a posterior lateral fusion, I mean herniation. Does that make sense? Okay. Is there coming back to the history? Is there a common presentation or is it just too much, too much variability as far as like how an annual material will have to like present? Like should we worsen the warnings that this is more hydrated? Well, a human annual tear, tear or a chronic annular tear. Well, so we get into the field of degenerative disc disease right. versus acute annular tear. These people are incapacitated. Right. They have a tear and they're on the floor. They look like a fracture. They can't get up. They can't do anything for two or three days. They're just absolutely incapacitated. So let's go into the chronic number of subacute annular tear. Is that generally worse in the morning? Is it better as the day goes on generally, or is it just too variable compared to the same? Most annular tears, and we're talking not stenosis or anything else, but just disc disorders. Right. They'll be a little stiff in the morning. They'll feel better for a shower, but it'll get worse toward the end of the day the more mechanically aggravated they are. That same with facet as well, or is facet? Facet will do the same thing, yeah. If you have bilateral facet disorder or disc disorder, they look the same. If you have a unilateral facet disorder, typically facet will have paravertebral pain on one side versus the disc, which is almost always central. There are rare exceptions to the rule, of course. Always are. Ask away. So then, what, back to this whole SI being just 6%. Um, right. Is that the same thing that you have with of SI pain. Well, I'm not sure etiology. The SI pain generates its own problem. The MRI, the x-rays, the CT can look normal. But you, you find from exam, but the key is injection. First key is to rule out sources other than the SI. And what are those typically? Facet, okay. disc, herniation. So if you have a radiculopathy, you're going to have SI pain. If you have a facet problem, you saw bog ducts and Dwyer's x-rays and I mean, uh, imaging, you're going to have referral pain into the buttocks. So I like to say that the SI joint is sort of the trash can of pain referrals. 
If you have an L1-2 radiculopathy, you have SI pain. If you have an L5-S1 radiculopathy, you have SI pain. So your job is to try and figure out where it's coming from. And if you've ruled out everything else, and you have two blocks into the SI that give you relief, that's diagnostic. Yes? That book lasted in uh, early April. Uh, yeah. did a series of studies and came up with a, uh, a cluster of tests. There's a physical exam test and product, they're all provocation tests. Do you ever use those? I do, and they are almost worthless. So you do gain, the best test for the SI joint is Gainsland's test. But that's, we did a study last year on SI joint provocation and tests were 10% accurate. So unfortunately, because you'd think that you know, do Faber's, you do a Gainsland's, you can do a shear and compression, and that'll give you the information, but it doesn't. But they, they cluster, so it has to be like four out of six before and I know um, Dirk, who works with these guys, he was involved in Vanderbilt's study, and, and they used Gainsland's as one of the tests in Holland. And they came up with a similar clustering provocation test. And if it was less than four, uh, you would basically would be, you know, a coin toss. But they had a pretty good odds ratio, I believe, like well, unfortunately, the, the studies that I've read in my own study indicate these tests are not helpful. You know, they talk about something called Fortin's finger test. They point right to the SI. I mean, all of these things sound to be wonderful, but they don't work. Yeah. Well, no, shoulder is better. Oh, yeah, a lot better than... Well, you know, you can look for cuff arthropathy. You know, there's... Yeah, it's, there's no question it's better. But the SI joint, unfortunately, the only absolute direct diagnosis is an injection times two. Yeah, what, uh, just, you know, I need to harp on the no, but, but uh, Charlie April was doing the blocks, which you're talking about, with like a lot of blocks, and they were blinded to each other. And they had this one test, which was kind of weird, but they had to do the blocks and the injections and everything and I think that in work uh, their group in Holland uh, reproduced the same thing. Using the injection as a gold standard, a reference standard when we're doing diagnostic tests. So it, anyway, I, just, I, I thought... I understand. Normal, but, yeah. We had 102 patients in our... 104? 100, uh, over 100 patients in our study, and the tests were not demonstrative to tell us who did and didn't have SI joint problems. Yeah, it's published in clinical research, orthopedics and clinical research. My pleasure. Because the first injection can be off. Dr. Evans can probably bring. Most insurance companies are going to do like the next step, but the rate of frequency inflation, the SI joint, quite a few of the pains to two And you can have false positives with these injections. So you don't want to jump into a surgery, an SI fusion unless you're going to be pretty darn sure that this joint is causing pain. So you have to do two tests because it's not uncommon for one test to be positive and one to be negative. Well then most likely the problem is not the SI joint unless the injecting guy or gal may be off. But if it's Evans, I don't worry about him. He's dead eye Evans as we call him. Does that all make sense? Okay.